Welcome to the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show, a broadcast service of globalbusinessnews.net. Now, here's your host, Ed Cohen. This is Ed Cohen in San Diego, and you're on Global TV Talk Show. Our special guest today is Hazel Trimmer from Columbia Sportswear. Hi there. Hello. Nice to join you. Oh, again, I know. Yeah. So I, I know you're on TV with uh, Ben uh, this week, too. Yes, I am. So, so it's a busy week. <laughs> media maven. Yes. <laughs> so we'll try to do something a little different so the audience doesn't... Uh, uh, tune out. We want them to tune in to everybody's show, not just mine. So, uh, is the company relocating anybody these days, or are they waiting to spring? I think it varies by industry. I think that it is naive, <clears throat> right, for anyone to think that companies are not thinking strategically about their talent. Um, I think even before COVID, many companies and even us in the industry were trying to, the biggest topic was how does mobility and, you know, global mobility, global immigration get a seat at the table, right? Like, I think that that was kind of top of mind. You know, if you go to any conference or if vendors invited you, I think that that was always a consistent topic, right? Um, but now with the pandemic, I think that there's been a concerted effort to really push uh, an openness to really look differently in, in a different strategy around talent. Um, I think the pandemic pushed um, kind of a forced conversation about looking at different ways on how to work differently, uh, different ways on how to look at uh, talent gaps, skill gaps, um, and and the working different. You know, you and I had a very interesting conversation um, uh, in a different uh, session about what does technology do, um, and how does it impact the way we work, and will it have an impact on mobility and global immigration? And my you know my feedback then, and it continues to be that. Um, it's, it's not really going to change how, um, it's not going to reduce the need of global mobility. It's not going to reduce the need of global immigration. It, and on the contrary, I think it's just going to add a different flavor of an option to how to deliver goods and services. I think depending on the industry, I think depending on how um, the value or the service, I think companies are just going to have to evolve differently on how they're going to um, keep up with the demand. Um, the diversity and inclusion is going to drive the agenda and driving meaningful services. So whatever product a company is delivering, um, you still have to be diverse in your thinking and you still have to connect with the people that you're delivering your goods and services and you have to bring that diversity in thought um, and address that um, in a meaningful way. And you can't um, do that in isolation. Um, there's something to be said in thinking um, uh, uh, abstractly, right? Um, these are different times and people are needing different things in how to work. And so the, the crossroads of those different complexities is what's going to continue to drive a need for mobility, uh, drive a need for moving talent around the world. The world is still getting smaller and smaller. Um, and then I think that that's what's going to drive a, a continued need for immigration and mobility to be a seat at the table. Um, I have some comments on that. But first, let me Please. ask you this uh, silly question. Uh, no silly questions. You're intentful. So I, I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready for you, Ed. That's <laughs> really fun. Um, do, do you, I, first of all, let me state that I think that the world is spinning faster than it did mm -hmm. last year, it, you know, because time is going faster, um, seemingly. And, um, you know, there's still 60 minutes in an hour. 
<laughs> but it's happening faster it seems like it feels like it absolutely yeah and there's so much like uh, like craziness and then something's causing that and and i just think the acceleration uh, is there not just pent up demand from people being um somewhat isolated uh in general for the past 20 months um but it it, it just seems that um same old, same old will continue. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. But I, I, I think that bosses, let's just say bosses, in a corporate structure, mm -hmm. and let's just say a, a large company, not doesn't have to be IBM or General Electric, but a large company. Mm -hmm. They're saying, do we really need this relocation thing? Why are people bringing all their junk with them across the ocean and it's stuck in the Suez Canal and nothing's happening? I mean, it's crazy. So uh, they have rental furniture stores. And by the way, tastes and looks are different over there than mm -hmm. here. Uh, uh, never mind the difference between South Carolina and San Diego, but from San Diego and Timbuktu, <laughs> wherever. So and why are people dragging all this stuff? That's not going to help the uh, moving a storage business, but um, th there's got to be a different way of doing things. And the DE and I thing, uh, which caught fire, you know, uh, a year ago, maybe a year and a half. I don't know whether it's pre-pandemic or people had nothing better to do, so it became a hot item. Uh, I think it was pre-pandemic. I think that there were yeah. subtleties. Well, it's of always been brewing. around, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the cost of doing relocations is nobody wants it on their line items, okay? And so it goes to corporate, uh, and you know it's a mess. So, and it's a, a source of friction internally in many companies. Uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes unspoken, but there. So now with the need to show ESG and DE and I uh, and the goodwill things, doing companies doing good, making a social statement or not a political statement, but participating in the conversation, they yeah. say, aha, relocation. <laughs> we can kill two birds with one stone here or three by placing de and i for front and forward in the relocation business uh, of getting people to represent the company and showing a different quote unquote face or image or culture uh, or depth to the customer base over there uh, by sending people of color or mixed or you know whatever the right words are these days and rather than contribute to the carbon imprint of being on a jet plane <laughs> uh, you, know, you know all this silly stuff that impacts the bottom line um, in effect it's not silly it's real but measurable i don't know about that but so i'm gonna i'm gonna challenge you in two points yeah good so, um, so relocation has become like a, a, not a dumping ground, but a place to achieve all these things and a trip and put dollars to work uh, through relocation and make them work in more than one way. And I'm done. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to challenge you in two different perspectives. Thank you. Um, the first is uh, I don't think that the intent is to use relocation as a scapegoat, as an easy way out to say we're diversifying through sending folks as another program to kind of put a label of DEI. I think, and, and at least for myself, I will say that the intent is if you are growing, a, I'm going to give you just one example. If you are growing, your next, let's say, bench two, bench three of senior leaders, right? And you're developing your people and knowledge base within the company. You need them to be exposed to all regions. You know, we're no longer, um, let's say, a US-centric filter. You're no longer 
a Asia Pacific filter. You're no longer a European filter. If you're truly a global company, you really want your future leaders, your future engineers, your future developers, your future designers that are going to lead a particular organization to have a global filter, to see that brand, to see that vision of the company, and to lead uh, with not just a centric or siloed perspective. Um, and so you want them to be exposed to the globe, to have that vision of understanding culturally um, the people, the consumer, the area, the region of the, the world that you want to consume your good services and products. So it's beyond, I think it's very limiting to just pigeonhole and stereotype DEI as just like, hey, I, I want this stamp because it's a good branding. Um, it's meaningful because you're impacting the shape of the services and the goods that you're producing. It's meaningful because you're leading with intent and purpose. And you need to be exposed, not through a camera and a computer, but meaningfully connecting on the ground to the people that you want to represent in those services, goods, products. And so whether you're an engineer one or a you know, manager one, level one in a company, and you are tagged as like the future path growth development um, of your company, I think it's important for anyone leading global mobility or global immigration to be um, in, in sync with developing a roadmap that's going to develop and nurture and create that filter that's cultural and that's diverse um, for the future of a company. Um, any company that's growing and developing and wants that global footprint, you don't want that footprint to be siloed, um, especially if you want market share. That means dollars. Ultimately, if you're going to be capitalist and you want to be revenue bearing, you want to represent the consumer that's going to buy your product. Um, so it's not just like, let's be warm and fuzzy and we just want to put that sticker on your website and say that you're DEI, but you want to be representative. Um, your products are not going to sell if, if it's all about the filter from your little, little part in the globe. Your products are not going to sell unless your product only is targeting a very definite little population. And that's great. If your company is only selling to a specific market, then great. Then you're, you're, you know your roadmap, you know your audience, you know that you're not going to go global and you're not aiming for a wide audience, then that's great, no judgment. But if you are a global company and you are marketing to a wide range of people, of diverse cultures, of diversity, and you are aiming to double your revenue, then it is important to have mobility and immigration because it is this backbone that's gonna generate the movement of people and you want diversity and thought and you want that. It's not more than just a DEI stamp. It's more than just programs of equity and inclusion. It's diversity and thought, it's diversity and imagination. It's representation of cultures of the very people that are gonna buy your goods and services. So that's what, where I question your first pivot, right? The second point um, I would argue is cost, right? Because if you want revenue to grow, you got to make a product that represents the audience that you're targeting. And look, I'm not going to judge people's programs, but if you're not dusting off your program and reevaluating your cost return on investment, then yeah, it is costly. But what is it worth to you? to increase your profit margins if you're not putting a bit of investment into it. Nothing is easy in this world. And for environmentally safe, I would question, I agree, you have to make some decisions of, do we include some extra shipment? You know, does it make sense for a six month assignment? You know, does it make sense? Or you have to be strategic in how you position some of these offerings for the purpose of what you're trying to get at and the goals. I think a lot of mobility leaders are doing that in light of some of the climate change initiatives. I think a lot of companies are doing that because they're focused on 
um, saving the planet. You don't want to exert and cost more waste if we're if the need is you know you we've got to be sensitive. We got to be cost effective, sensitive. We got to be um, climate change awareness. Um, you know why why ship a twenty foot container if you're only going on a twenty uh, on a six month assignment. Some things are just wasteful, period. Money wasteful, planet wasteful, energy wasteful. So I think a lot of mobility leaders are really looking at the whole spectrum and being a little bit more savvy about making better decisions from a program perspective. Well said. That's a good. lot to unpack, Ed, a lot to unpack. Yeah. So <laughs> let's, let's talk about uh, assignments and yeah. uh, measuring success. Um, we're, yeah, we're going to tackle some deep things here today. You're really uh, hitting hard today, Ed. Gosh. So, yeah, this is not softball TV. This is hardball. <laughs> you saved all the hard questions for me? Gosh, okay. We're doing well, this. Well, I've already had two cups of coffee. So I'm just, it's only <laughs> nine something here. So... <laughs> I might get back into bed after this. I'm not sure. I might just hide under the, the desk. I don't know. I might just call it a day. Go for it. Measures so, of success. So I'm working with you in South Carolina today. And uh, and then uh, following this, I, I'm going to work with a, a, a guy in Dallas, North Dallas. And... Um, And then I'm trying to do some other things, but <laughs> everybody's really busy all of a sudden now that the borders have opened and the economy is, in general, people are out spending money. They're not saving any money, they're spending it. And the, the economy is just red hot. And it's about to get hotter if they get these uh, congressional things solved. But uh, because they're just going to throw money at everything. And to just imagine the the, uh, the growth. Let's just say in South Carolina, you know, the, the growth from climate change stuff uh, and all the money that will be thrown at that. So Columbia is a little inland. I happen to know that, but Charleston, beautiful Charleston, historic, is going to get overwhelmed by the ocean. <laughs> um, and uh, what are they going to do about it? I don't know. What are they going to do? Build, build seawalls uh, and trap in um, the people <laughs> so they can't see the water? You know, what, I what, hope not. Charleston is beautiful. What's going to happen? Wow. So, um, but they're going to try things, that's for sure. I mean, back in, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago when Hurricane Sandy I bring this up because it was in the news recently, uh, but uh, about the storm, the Northeast rainstorm or something that, that that everybody was worried about last week, but I don't think it ever materialized, but there was certainly a lot of news about it. Um, Hurricane Sandy came into New York, New Jersey, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, right? It made, made a mess, right? And nobody thought it would be uh, so strong. Um, and nobody even thought about flooding, you know, that the water comes over the seawall in downtown Manhattan, <laughs> near the World Trade Center and that whole area there. Yeah, was, Wall Street was flooded. Was flooded. Uh, yeah, and a lot of buildings, I don't know if, you know, to this day they've even opened because the water ruins the... Uh, the basements uh, mm -hmm. seeped in from underneath because uh, of the pressure and ruined electrical systems and pipings and all that stuff. Anyway, I was producing one of my live conferences in Midtown Manhattan on that day, as it turns out. And my host partner was a nice company called JP Morgan. Okay? Oh, okay on Park Avenue in their world headquarters. And we were in this fabulous conference room and people came in absolutely drenched, you know, wearing a slicker. There's one gal, I'm not going to mention her name, but she was a senior 
uh, in HR, one of my guest speakers, and she trudged in from Brooklyn or something, which is not very far, but she was wearing these yellow galoshes <laughs> that came up to her knees, and they had to take everything off just about because it was she was so. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> and then we did, we we had a great meeting, but nobody wanted to leave. Everybody just stayed. <laughs> who who would? Who uh, would? Ed? Right, right. So there I was, a guy from San Diego in Midtown Manhattan at the pinnacle of business power during the hurricane. So, so did you hit anybody with the kind of hard-hitting question you we're discussing today? Did you, did you nail anybody? Did you cross examine anybody? Um, well, they haven't invited me back, so maybe I did. <laughs> Wait, come on. Come no. on. No, we've had a couple of minutes there. I just, Wonderful. I'm, I'm just trying to <laughs> be funny. Uh, but no, uh, you are. There's no try. You are clearly. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about assignment measurement. Um, whose yes. job is it? Is it the line manager? You know, the uh, the, the, the 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 boss, the uh, direct uh, supervisor, who's a po who's sent me on assignment to say Lisbon. Okay, not a bad place. I'll do that. I'll go. You'll <laughs> but, go. Uh, you volunteer. But, I volunteer as tribute. Yes. And so, <laughs> uh, and uh, well, that's so a great. That's, what that's, what that's, do these people expect from me? What what do they want? And then what am I going to do with my new skills? Uh, and uh, am I going to get forgotten, or is this a, a ticket out of the company, or, or what? <laughs> So, you know, I think that that's a really fantastic question, and I don't know if it's talked about enough. Um, I think amongst some of my peers that we get together uh, with, you know, privately and, and frequently, I think we, we try to kind of toss around that. I think um, openly, I think over time, it's not, it's hard to juggle a lot of priorities, I think, in, in you know, there's so many competing uh, agendas and priorities, but it is a topic that I think it is critical. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I think it's a village effort. From a program structure, it is important as a mobility leader, uh, it's upon us to kind of structure assignments um, and give guidance. Um, there's, I believe it's 50-50, it's you know, as a mobility leader, it behooves us to own and have some of the onus. Um, your program really needs to have a bit of stake in that. Um, the success of an assignment includes the return. You know, uh, 60, 90 day check-ins. Is it successful during? Are you, know, are, are you setting expectations for when somebody requests an assignment, whether it's a leader um, and there's a position that needs to be filled, are you having that consultative partnership? You know, are you asking the right questions? Because you do not want an individual to be put at risk for career death, meaning nothing for the return. You want to be a strategic partner to the business to say, what are your thoughts on the return? You know, th those should be full conversations at the very beginning. It should never be a, you know, okay, we're gonna just, you're not just executing. You're not an administrative service or a shared service uh, arm. You are a consultative seat at the table and you're doing a disservice to the people that are entrusting you going through your service arm. Um, you know, sometimes even blindly, innocently, because they're so excited that they've been, you know, honored and selected for this type of adventure, this it is a fantastic move on a person's career to have global exposure. So as global mobility leaders um, and anyone in the mobility space, I think we have part of that responsibility to guide the conversation, to be strategic, but it also falls on managers and leaders. When you're thinking of a need, when you're thinking of a person, when you have a gap somewhere else, whether it's in the US or outbound or anywhere around the world, I think it's a mutual responsibility. Um, and it needs to be had openly, that conversation before the person is brought into the conversation that's being considered. And as you're outlining expectations, that has to be clearly articulated. Um, and if 
if there's any risk, you know, one thing Ed, that I, I like to talk about and I string it in every conversation is that's part of the awkward, you, in mobility, you have to have awkward conversations and you have to be comfortable in it. And, and part of talking about sending someone on an international assignment is there's no guarantees. We cannot guarantee you a spot on the return, especially if you're going on a two-year assignment. The company could look very different. We can't guarantee you. So that has to be part of the risk reward conversation. Hi, this is Ed, and I thank you for tuning in to Global TV Talk Show, a uh, unit on globalbusinessnews.net. Uh, we uh, broadcast to the world, as you know by now. So I wanted to make sure that you understand that our programs are advertising supported. We're grateful for their co-sponsors, advertisers. Um, they have a marketing budget coupled with a strong desire to be associated with our top quality program. And of course, I'm grateful. Thank you. So for the next few minutes, you're going to see some uh, commercials. It's uh, mostly very low key. And uh, our prices are very, very reasonable. Uh, our exposure for the advertisers go 12 months and beyond. Some of our advertisers have been with us since March, April of 2020. And Google Analytics has tracked uh, over 125,000 what they call audience page views, which means you looking at this page, that's a page view. Now, if you happen to go to one of our other shows or to our radio broadcasts or to our newspaper or magazine, those become additional page views as measured by Google Analytics. And so when they say 125,000 since uh, spring of 2020 up through uh, Labor Day a month ago, that's pretty good numbers. And uh, the past 30 days, Google Analytics has measured uh, just under 6,000 audience page views. Uh, and that, according to them, is a 42% increase in audience participation over the month of August. So thank you very much. Well, here's our advertisers, and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes or so, and we'll proceed with this interesting conversation. Thank you. This episode from the Meeting Room of Global TV Talk Show is brought to you by The Bridge School, the accredited international online private school of choice at bridgek12.org. Porch Light Rental and Destination Services. Reduce your renter lump sum or managed relocation costs. Visit them at porchlightrental.com. And by Airs.com. With our full range of services, we can help design, and manage your international relocation. Find us at airs.com. Primestone Partners, featuring corporate, government, and developer housing solutions, as well as senior level advisory services. Find them at primestonepartners.com. And by International Auto Source. We are the vehicle experts for expats, featuring all major brands of automobiles with flexible solutions and financing. On the web at intlauto.com. Become a global player in your field. Cross Culture To Go provides virtual support for your global business and career success. We can help you thrive in 140 plus countries and markets. On the web at crossculturetogo.com. Something that's really neat is that the Bridge School partners with various organizations to provide learning for their students. For example, we partner with a major ballet company and we are able to enroll several of their students into our school. So now not only is the student able to participate in a school and have a seamless transition while they're very active in their ballet career, but now they have um, 
other dancers that are with them that are doing some of the same courses. So it's almost becoming a, a camaraderie where they're taking similar courses, they're working together on their ballet, and really being able to form this great partnership with these organizations to provide a needed service. A lot of times um, there are student athletes who will spend hours and hours at the gym or um, at the, the basketball courts, wherever it is. And if they're attending a traditional school, they're in school from eight to three. They get a quick snack and then they're at the gym for three to four hours in the evening. Coming to us and having that partnership, they're able to break that up throughout the day. They can have a morning practice, get some schooling in, have an afternoon practice, finish their schooling in the evening. So there's that flexibility. And additionally, if there are tournaments or performances, it's fantastic because if there's a week where they have shows straight through, they can take that week off of learning and then pick back up when they're done. So it offers this great flexibility. And for the program owners of these sports leagues, it is a win-win situation for them because they see this need. They see this need that their students need to make sure that they are obtaining the grades necessary to be successful adults in, in our country and in other countries. But it provides them an environment where they can be successful at both. Hi, I'm Sergei Gorbatov. I'm Angela Lane. Together we are researchers, writers and practitioners in the field of human resources. And we've also been multi-country, multi-assignment career experts. We owe our professional development and growth to a very large extent to the international assignment opportunities that we have had. But in a world where distributed work may become the norm, we also want to understand what will happen to the nature, duration and purpose of international assignments? Together with our colleague Julian Dalzell from the University of South Carolina, we're undertaking a study on the future of expatriation. And we'd value your contribution. You can participate in this important study by completing a simple 10-minute questionnaire. Access the questionnaire by typing in your browser tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. That's tinyurl.com forward slash expert study. You can also find the link here on Ed's website next to this video. Thank you for joining us in this study. In return for your contribution, we'll provide you with a copy of our research. And of course, you'll be invited to an exclusive webinar hosted by Ed, where we will share our findings right here on Global Business News. And so please go to tinyurl.com forward slash expat study. Take the survey so that we can better understand the future of expatriation. So then as a transferee, let's say I'm the transferee and, and you have my boss. And so I, I, I would have to say, that, okay, then I implicitly or explicitly, I have your permission to um, be in touch with other people in the company uh, yeah. and introduce myself and what I'm doing and maybe ask for advice as to, okay, while I'm here in Lisbon and I'm dealing with the, these situations, how will that uh, benefit you and your department, let's uh, say two years from now when I become available? And could we keep this conversation going, blah, 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 you know? Absolutely. Uh, that sounds like it could be disruptive, but also quite beneficial for everybody. For everybody. So normally what happens is again, you know, when it's a year out, and I know that's a little conservative, I, I, I like to be a little conservative because we're talking about so many different things closing and wrapping up, but like a year out, do a check-in. How is your career? How's your job? Are we on, still on track? six months out, how have you checked in with your manager, with your leader? Are we still on track to end the assignment? So encouraging those conversations, being open, you know, mobility, we have, we're monitoring the assignment, right? So there has to be some accountability to kind of encourage these conversations, 
Do you have a plan? It's time to, you know, 60 days, 90 days. Now you're upping the conversation. Do we own finding a place for the return? No, but we do own being strategic and encouraging those conversations between the employee and the manager. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, 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 and acknowledging the risks up front. There has to be transparency of the pros and the cons. There has to be that transparency up front. And that is part of duty of care, of building that trust, building that relationship with all parties. Giving that transparency to everyone involved allows people to make educated based decisions of what they're stepping into and allowing them to make the best decision for themselves. Because just, Ed, if you, were my, if you were my direct report, I'm empowering you and offering you this opportunity. But if I don't give you all the facts, how are you then able to make the best decision for yourself and for your career? You have an onus too in this conversation. But if I don't give you all the facts and the mobility manager doesn't also do the same, then you're not able to kind of advocate for yourself. Let's talk about stakeholders. So, um, and if I'm saying something wrong, just redirect me, okay? (laughs) Uh, uh, Just say, I don't want to talk about that. So, um, you have to deal with uh, different managers in in Colombia, and you have uh, probably come across people with the title HRBP, uh, you know, business partner. Um, and that's sort of like a, a floating manager of sorts, right? It was sort of gets in the middle of things, but doesn't really have any line authority, right? But it could be a perfect vehicle, hypothetically, it could be a perfect vehicle for you as a mobility leader to, uh, you can't reach out to this CEO, but you could get a message up the chain of command through somebody like the BP who can easily talk to the CHRO uh, minute by minute, probably on a variety of things. And mobility isn't probably one of their regular daily things, but how else can you get a message about, you know, the assignee, let's just say me, I'm having uh, difficulty learning Portuguese. Uh, but uh, I get along well, and uh, I love the seafood, <laughs> and we go to food, we go to eat a lot there. So because that's how people can get to know each other. Uh, so how does how does that message get from me to you to somebody higher up, or in a decision making capacity uh, in in your company to impact my assignment? results? So I think in any company, really, I mean, honestly, I think that with within all company structures, the HR business partner role is quite dynamic, right? Um, and every company, that role, whether it's HR business partner VP, HR business partner, uh, HR business partner direct, like, it, it fluctuates to your point. <laughs> Um, But they have a very interesting seat um, because they are advocates and anyone in my space, you really need to learn um, any particulars that are structured for your HR organization and then partner um, and know when to partner and then start like really defining a racy, right? Um, I think that's critical. Uh, Partnerships are critical. Um, but to your example, I would say that there's not, I, I, you know, it's interesting in the mobility space, um, I think every mobility leader would probably start differentiating what's, what could be contained at our level within our program and decisions and authority to the employee and the needs or emergencies that come up within it an employee space, there's caps and autonomy that are granted, right? So 
if an emergency comes up, I think every program is different. Every company is different. Um, but there is autonomy that needs to kind of in practicality and being pragmatic. And then there's things that, you know, the CHRO for every company would, would want to know. And you have to kind of be very self-aware about those type of uh, scenarios. Um, but when it comes to an employee need, um, at least I'm grateful that I'm at a company that um, keeps the employee first. Um, and if there's uh, an urgency, then they're very employee centric. That's really good. I'm happy for you. It's great. Yeah. So, so Columbia is a, a global company, right? I, mm -hmm. I know you're selling stuff globally. I don't know if you're oh, making Oh, they're it. a global company. Yeah. Uh, so uh, is there manufacturing outside the U.S. or within the U.S.? Um, I think, uh, and I just started about nine weeks ago. So I think they do have presence all over the world in that space. Yeah, interesting. It's so competitive. Sports it is. Uh, it's it a is. Sport, it's sportswear, right? Yes, but yeah. they have different brands and um, there's different brands that really target the needs of um, just very different. And I'm, I'm learning more about it every day, um, but I'm, I'm learning that they're targeting very um, specific needs across different um, groups and different ages. And I, I mean, I'm really enjoying learning all about that and specifically for me, um, casual wear. Um, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really, I'm buying. <laughs> so I'm enjoying it. Oh, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> so uh, the, the shirt I'm wearing, uh, uh, it's a Walmart. Uh, I don't know. I think it was made in Indonesia or something, but, but um, I easily could have bought Columbia, right? If I uh, mm -hmm. was presented with an opportunity to look at it. I don't know about price, but but uh, it's just like a t-shirt, but it's like become my uniform. Not that I wear mm. the same, not that I wear the same shirt every day, but <laughs> but on a lot of broadcasts I'm wearing black. And so I have a black collar shirt, I have a black sweatshirt, and I have a black pullover sweater. What are you the next Steve Jobs? Oh um, you only no, pull I, a standard like easy. I'm just uh, the only Ed Cohen. That's all. <laughs> One and only. So um, I'm just getting old. You can see since we last met, my hair has turned white. Look at all this. It's amazing. No, yeah, me too. It's oh, probably no, the, the questions, the tough, the tough questions you hit me. <laughs> You're making me go gray. I'm going to blame you. It's easy. Oh, okay. So can you see my, my shadow there? Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at the screen here and it looks like there's a light here and yes. uh, and on the red wall it looks like it's my avatar or emoji or something behind me. so i was just wondering whether it's visible to you on the screen a little bit hmm. okay we'll see how it comes out on the recording so um <laughs> so paul will do his magic and see what happens so uh, let's talk about you know, 22 coming up. I mean, it's already the end of this year. My God, seven weeks or so. It's crazy. Um, is the company gearing up for more reloads? Uh, you know, I know we touched on this a little early, but I don't remember what you said. So I'm asking again, it, is 22 looking like it's going to be much more active or about the same? You know, I think that for many companies, um, and, you know, I'm seeing all the LinkedIn panel discussions and a lot of, uh, and just talking to my peers, I think this year was just a recalibration. You know, we've seen what COVID did. I think companies kind of, you know, just hunkered down and then they spent their time kind of like reacting and breathing and pausing. But during that time, a lot of us kind of started, okay, let's get our ducks in a row. Let's revamp, reevaluate, let's adjust. Let's see what this really means and how do we pivot? And I think that prepared us for now the gearing up. Like 
you know, if, if, if you didn't do that this year, then you're going to be shocked. You're going to be behind the eight ball going into next year. So I think next year is it's game time. It's definitely game time. The, about the great resignation, if you will, is, is Columbia experiencing that now or uh, is that not in? Oh, no, I, I don't, I don't think Columbia has been really impacted. I think this is a, a really interesting company to work for. Um, it's a passionate family. Um, their family values, their concerted concern for their employee population, not just in the U.S., but across the globe, resonates with passion um, within Good. their employee population. You're lucky. So, Good. I do feel lucky. Um, so I, I think that their employees feel it. Um, and so I don't think that they, and this is just now an observation. Um, I don't think that they, they're running steady. And I think that I, I don't personally see an impact. Um, I think that they're just gonna keep on going steady. I, I don't see that they really care or, are influenced by what other companies are like they're running steady they're confident like they're they're really they have mama boils grit um and they're really steady on their course and they have a vision for what they want to accomplish and in, in getting people outdoors and in a healthy mindset of connecting um everyone outside um and honestly that's what got many people through the pandemic, you know, what happened, everybody started, you know, really getting connected back to basics, connecting back to hiking and getting people outdoors, which helped a lot of people who never really did that before, get rebalanced and re-centered and re-just purposeful. And I think that if they keep on doing what they've been doing, they don't need to compete. They don't need to look at what the other guys are doing. They're just going to stay the course. And that's what's beautiful about what attracts people and attracts talent to Columbia Sportswear. Um, that's the beauty and what they provide um, and the integrity in, by which they provide it. It's a really good story. Um, and you're fortunate to be in that kind of culture. It's the that was brand. very purposeful. It's when, the, the brand. Yeah. Yeah, and it, and it speaks into the quality of what they produce. Um, and it speaks to um, everyone from the stores to manufacturing to their distribution centers, um, everyone from HR, um, everyone I've come across. Um, there's a passion and a drive um, to genuinely connect people and be purposeful in and then giving peace and harmony and connecting people to just that grounding, right? Um, and I think that resonates in, in the products that they produce, right? Um, so there's no interest in figuring out what anybody else is doing or, you know, there's really not a focus in that. And I think that that comes through in our branding and everything that's happening externally. So this program, um, uh, the distribution of, Global TV programs uh, is a, a little bit different. Uh, we don't really go for a live audience on the day of the recording. Uh, if it happens, yes. it's great. But we we definitely use intelligent marketing systems uh, once we get the program ready for on demand, and then we'll circulate it around the world to our very long list of industry contacts. Uh, U.S. and global. About 75% is U.S., Canada, Mexico, Brazil. Oh, and, muy bien. Bienvenidos, los Latinos. And about 20% uh, is uh, across Europe. Uh, and more than half of that is a uh, London area. Um, so um, that gives you just a quick idea of who this program will be sent to. But about 9% Asia Pacific with India and Singapore being uh, the most so far. Uh, 
sizable in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Taipei, Manila, Seoul, Australia, and New Zealand, but it's mostly India and uh, Singapore. Uh, so this is the audience that we have and um, probably 40%, maybe even more will be corporate. No, not, no, no. People like you, as well as um, <laughs> uh, CHROs and BP, HRBPs, uh, we have long lists of all these, these people. And uh, LinkedIn is uh, a major distribution vehicle for us. Um, so this program will be viewed by people who are new to the mobility function as well as old timers like me. So, and me. So um, to the people who are new, uh, they're techie and I wasn't <laughs> until fairly recent and I wouldn't even label myself that now, but I certainly can make Zoom work. So um, tech has taken over. Yes. Right. And so if you had a robot in your room, uh, whether it's Siri or somebody, um, Waldo or whatever, what would you have the robot do when we get off this call? Oh, gosh. And this is the last question you're asking me. You really, you're <laughs> up in the ante. <laughs> Ed. Um, what would I have the robot do? Uh, gosh, uh, rein in my kids. <laughs> Read to your kids? Is that what you no, said? No, rain in. Oh, rain my in. Kids. They're like uh, a fishing rod. Yeah, yeah, rain them in. Yeah. You know, they're tracked out. No, uh, on a serious note. With you, Ed, I got to throw in a little humor. Come on. Um, <laughs> no. You know, I think if we had a robot, especially to the mobility audience, um, look, technology is the, the way to the future, continues to be. I mean, I've been in this for more than 15 years. I'm gonna say 15, um, but I think it was important 15 years ago. It continues to be important. So for, if I had a magical robot standing next to me, I would say dashboards, data, projections, cost estimates, real time crunching as things are happening and then bringing it all succinctly together. If I had a magical, you know, magical robot, if I could afford, you know, I just saw a pod, you know, a, a session um, with, you know, a colleague of mine from the past over at IBM. I think, you know, some of that stuff is fantastic. I mean, you know, it's interesting where we're pushing the industry, and I and I think uh, it's going to be just continuously pushing the envelope, like continuously taking us into, you know, again that magical robot standing next to me. Uh, as a mobility leader, it's we're pulling more and more data from sister organizations. So it's no longer going to be, you know, if I talk to younger folks coming up behind me, it's no longer going to be um, just mobility and just immigration, but the pressure from the company, the pressure from talent you know, management. Ta right. It's talent right. management now. Right. You know, right. we can't be siloed, but we, again, sitting at the table. We are a tool, a powerful tool to drive companies forward in their business strategy. And that powerful tool, it, we got to pull data, data from recruiting. We got to pull data for talent management. It's succinctly driving those other data points to make meaningful strategic dashboards to help interpret and be that message to help leadership make decisions. So if I had a robot, that's what I would help have that robot do. It's cool. On that note, what, what more, Ed, as we wind it down? Yeah, okay. I, I, I was going to ask something oh. different, but... Um, go ahead. I, no, uh, well... I thought... No, go ahead. <laughs> shoot. Okay, so... Back to the experience of the transferee. And wouldn't it make sense to require the transferee to become a coach, mentor, 
to somebody who's going to follow that transferee after their assignment ends and they move on, somebody else is going to fill that role where the transferee is spending time right now. And rather than let that experience escape, apply that knowledge, that book of knowledge of experience, um, especially in a, if there's a spouse or family situation, how do you handle all this stuff, all these issues, all this impact on your life actually, caused by going on assignment? Yeah, and actually early on in my career, um, on and off, um, I think many of us on the industry, um, I've seen this um, and I think there's, and I've heard of companies that have done and instituted this idea successfully. Um, it's been on my wish list from a long-term plan. Um, I think it's a beautiful concept. Um, I know that it can be done successfully. I've seen it done and I've heard of my peers do it. Um, I think it is beautiful. It could be done on a volunteer basis because you really can't force. It's a big commitment. Um, and then I, I know that there is like expat communities where, the, you know, there's uh, support groups um, where people, you know, who've been through an expat assignment, um, they'll share information. But I think formally companies, um, I have heard um, and I, I, I've had it on my wish list as part of my program and creating my programs um, to create that as part of a fundamental service. Um, and so, yes, I completely agree. I think that that is knowledge um, that is beckoning to be part of the program and that should be leveraged like a mentor mentee. This has been a learning experience, Hazel. Thanks for being on Global TV. You know, a pleasure. I, I love that you, you know, <laughs> I haven't gotten booted off yet, so I love it. <laughs> so let's, let's hug. Let's hug. Hello. A little virtual Hello. hug. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good one. Have a wonderful one. Thank you for joining us in the meeting room at Global TV Talk Show. Have a wonderful day, and stay safe.